It appears we have two camps as it relates to Israel versus Iran. We have global institutions acting in unison in full support of military action by Israel, constantly expressing itself through world leaders, a powerful lobby indeed. On the other side, we have the Lone Ranger in shining armour, Rebel MP George Galloway, seemingly the only voice found in the mainstream against attack on Iran. But are things as they seem? Are we witnessing a real debate held in the beliefs of those who make noise about Israel and Iran? Or is this a scripted play, an act, to cover a secret so grave that what the world witnessed unleashed in only one country in 1933 is to be set forth across the whole world. I believe there are two questions in need of serious answers. One, do the politicians know what they are doing? Two, is George Galloway sincere in his stand against Israel? Let us look now at those in full agreement that Israel should be allowed to attack Iran. You have applauded UN sanctions and sanctions adopted by the United States and Europe against Iran. I hope that other nations and other leaders follow the US and President Obama's lead and target hard sanctions against, primarily against Iran's energy sector. This regime basically lives off oil uh, and cannot do without the import of gasoline. Iran is a very brutal regime. It brutalizes its own people. It sponsors terrorism left and right against my own country, against others, and it calls for the destruction of the Jewish state. Uh, I, think, I think it should not be allowed to happen. I think it is wholly unacceptable for Iran to have nuclear weapons capability. I think we've got to be prepared to confront them, uh, if necessary, militarily. I, I think there is no alternative to that. common message to the Iranians that, uh, uh, that it's uh, their behavior, kind of trying to clandestinely develop a nuclear weapon or using the guise of a civilian nuclear weapon program to get the know-how to develop a nuclear weapon is unacceptable. The world does not want and must work together to avoid a nuclear Iran. Another one said, I want to destroy the Jews of the world. And another one said, only when no Jews are living, the world will be better. We know that the Shoah came. Take Ahmadinejad very seriously. I'd love to think there's something to negotiate w w with Iran about, but you have a, a president there who his, his sworn aim is to wipe Israel off the face of the map and kill every Jew in the Middle East. The United States, the United Kingdom, and France presented detailed evidence to the IAEA demonstrating that the Islamic Republic of Iran has been building a covert uranium enrichment facility near Qom for several years. Iran is refusing to live up to those international responsibilities, including specifically revealing all nuclear-related activity. So world leaders based entirely on intelligence data are in agreement a nuclear Iran must not be tolerated. We then have the no camp to which George Galloway takes the leading role. The regime in Iran is very aggressive indeed and have made they may not mean it, and we don't know, but you've got to take them at their word. If they say, if the leader of Iran says he wants to wipe uh, Israel off the face didn't of the earth. He didn't say that, and you know very well he didn't say that. He no. said he wanted Zionism to be wiped off the page of history. Well, just like he said, Nazism and communism. When you wanted to wipe out communism, you didn't want to wipe out Russia. You didn't want to wipe out the Russian people. This was a political statement. But George, it's all right in the news record, of the world, but this George, is the Oxford Union, Francis. George, Have a bit of intellectual rigor. Uh, George, okay. your record of... Your record of... Uh, you know where Iran's nuclear facilities are, although you didn't appear to know that there are more than 80 in number, and they're not in northern Iran. They're all over Iran. And then you tell me that that would be the target because of intelligence. Now, I'm sorry, James, but there will be people listening to this who don't know whether to laugh or cry at somebody like you, an intelligent man, coming on and repeating the mantra about intelligence when you know what you know now about the intelligence that led us into the disaster in Iraq, James. If I can answer that, George, of course. 
if you're suggesting that there's going to be a full military invasion of Iran... No, I'm not suggesting that. James, I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm telling you, and I promise you on this, and I hope you never have to phone me up and say that I was right... I'm promising you this. Do not imagine that Iran will treat a strategic strike any differently from a full-scale invasion. Trust me on this, James. I know what I'm talking about. If we bomb Iran, Iran will bomb us back. And amongst the places it will bomb us is here in the center of London. Innocent people will die. Don't imagine for one second that the deaths will be restricted to Iranians in the north of Iran or anywhere else. Any attack on Iran will be met by a full-scale response by Iran everywhere and anywhere. Trust me on that, James. George Galloway makes it very clear. He knows that if Iran is attacked, there will be serious consequences for Britain. Specifically, he says, London. Having already attacked four Sunni Islamic countries and continuing to do so, we have had no terror attacks in Britain save for the abomination of 2005 and the London bombings. Those bombings are at the very least suspect as it relates to any involvement by Muslims in the tragic events. The cohesion of George's rhetoric, though based in fact, is falling apart. So according to George, having a 96% Sunni Muslim population in Britain and having been involved in great slaughter in Sunni countries since 2001, the idea Muslims will bomb Britain as a response to actions the elite are taking in their cultural homelands is unfounded. The odds for a full-scale response presented by George Galloway as fact that he promises as such, given there is only a 2% representation of Shia amongst the Muslims in Britain, is not only a ludicrous conclusion, it has absolutely no basis in fact. So what is going on here? which is why we must disable it from having nuclear weapons. Well, you say that, but I wonder, living in Suffolk, if you're just maybe imagining you'll be safe from being disabled yourself. But let me tell you, as someone who lives in London, who represents a 100,000 souls in London, who lost constituents the last time an underground train blew up, let me tell you, there'll be a lot of disabled people in London in return for your disablement of Iraq's, uh, sorry, Iran's nuclear power plants, which are absolutely legal, which they have as much right to develop as we do, and any attempt to bomb Iran, which you're attempting to sanitize with all your military talk, any attempt to bomb Iran will not be one strategic strike on one place in the north of Iran. It will have to be hundreds of strategic strikes on more than 80 places, even if it's only restricted to the nuclear uh, plants. And there's every reason to believe in the wake of the American statement, criminalizing, making terrorists of the Revolutionary Guard in Iran, which is 150,000 people, which is an indispensable part of Iran's military forces, as terrorists, there's no reason to believe that they're not going to be attacked as well. And I, I'm telling you, James, and you seem strangely unmoved by it. Iran is not a broken-backed country. Don't imagine this is some cheap, broken-down, darkest African, impotent, defenseless country that you are so, so uh, 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 somnolently uh, seeking to uh, talk us into bombing. Iran will respond ferociously everywhere if we attack Iran. Self-defense, James. Uh, the real nightmare scenario is the prospect of mullahs in Iran having weapons... Well, tell me, James, why is that more of a nightmare scenario than Ariel Sharon having hundreds of nuclear weapons? Or George Bush having thousands of nuclear weapons? Or General Musharraf who's one bullet away from Islamic revolution in Pakistan having nuclear weapons, or the government of India which refuses uh, to live up to its uh, promises under the non-proliferation treaty. Why are some people, James, allowed to have nuclear weapons, but others are not? The threat that we face from Iran is far, far greater than the threat we face from the United States. Why do we face a threat from Iran? What has Iran ever done to us? 
Iran hasn't invaded another country in more than 300 years. And 300 Spartans saw them off. George Galloway's use of the term 300 Spartans is very interesting. And the reason I have put this video together. Dr. John Coleman, a man born in 1935, who operated as an MI6 officer for some 25 years, specifically while in Angola, he believed fighting communism, found to his astonishment that what he was actually doing was implementing the social structure, also known as communism, within the African nations. This prompted John to write a book. Dr. Coleman formed a book called The Conspirators Hierarchy, The Story of the Committee of 300, which he says is a grouping of global families of extreme wealth working together to bring about a global dictatorship. He found this information in documents he was handed while in Angola. Dr. Coleman states that the Committee of 300 exists and that is how they are known unto themselves. But he also states that in intelligence circles, they are known as the Olympians. So we are looking at Greek symbolism here. The Committee of 300 was born out of the British East India Company, as they pushed heroin across India and China. The committee was formed through alliances with families in countries under attack by the British East India Company. And had it not been for collusion of families within nations such as India, China and Japan, then the importation of opium into these nations would not have been possible. The reality of this information can be seen in such underworld networks as the Triads and Hong Kong Society, both born in China during the opium running into China during the period known as the Opium Wars. In studying Chinese history, it appears the families ensuring the opium flow into China were of Mongolian descent. They are not of the Chinese origin. The same reality shows itself in India, specifically under the Parsis race, better known today as Tartar. In the 17th century, Henry Lord, a chaplain with the British East India Company, noted that the Parsis came to India seeking liberty of conscience, but simultaneously arrived as merchantmen bound for the shores of India in course of trade and merchandise. That the Arabs charged non-Muslims higher duties when trading from Muslim-held ports may be interpreted to be a form of religious persecution. But that this was the only reason to migrate appears unlikely. That persecution was the sole motivating factor to emigrate has also been questioned by Parsis themselves. And both factors, the need to open new avenues of trade and the desire to establish a Zoroastrian community in that area that was free from Muslim harassment, entered into the decision to emigrate to Gujarat. The remaining estates, the nobility, soldiers and civil servants, farmers, herdsmen, artisans and labourers, were folded into an all comprehensive class today known as the Badini, or followers of Deine, for which good religion is one translation. This change would have far-reaching consequences. For one, it opened the gene pool to some extent since until that time, inter-class marriages were exceedingly rare. This would continue to be a problem for the priesthood until the 20th century. For another, it did away with the boundaries along occupational lines, a factor that would endear the Parsis to the 18th and 19th century British colonial authorities that had little patience for the unpredictable complications of the Hindu caste system such as a clerk from one caste who would not deal with the clerk from another. Under Shab Abbas I, Iran prospered. He also transplanted a colony of industrious and commercially astute Armenians from Jolfa in Azerbaijan to a new Jolfa next to Esfahan. He patronised the arts and he built palaces, mosques and schools, Esfahan becoming the cultural and intellectual capital of Iran. Shah Abbas encouraged international trade and the production of silks, carpets, ceramics and metalware for sale to Europeans. Shah Abbas also founded a carpet factory in Esfahan. Royal patronage and influence of court designers assured that Persian carpets reached their zenith in elegance during the Safavid period. He advanced trade by building and safeguarding roads. 
He welcomed tradesmen from Britain and Netherlands and elsewhere to Iran. His governmental monopoly over the silk trade enhanced state revenues. Merchants of the English East India Company established trading houses in Shiraz and Esfahan after Shah Abbas ousted the Portuguese from the island of Hormuz at the entrance to the Persian Gulf in 1622. Bandar Abbas, or Port of Abbas, became the centre of the East India Company's trade, but later the Dutch East India Company received trade capitulations from Shah Abbas. The Dutch soon gained supremacy in the European trade with Iran, outdistancing British competitors. They established the spice trading centre at Bandar Abbas in 1623-24. Shah Abbas I launched an offensive against Ottomans and established control over Kurdish territories, Baghdad and the Shia holy cities of Najaf and Karbala. So what does this mean? And how does it affect the issue between Israel and Iran? So given we do indeed have a supranational committee of 300 global families, a cartel of families of such wealth it would be hard to imagine by your average man on the street, that this cartel operates within every country on the globe to the same agenda, an agenda to bring the entire Earth's tradable resources under absolute command of the cartel itself, of the super wealthy. Then any ideas there is a nation existent not under control of the cartel has got to be pure fantasy. Having understood the fact only 2% of the Muslim community in Britain are of the Shia, and a reality to be found across the whole world, then the only people in the position to enact a ferocious response would be the families making up the cartel of wealth, the Committee of 300. The third and final question would be, how does this deception serve a cartel of 300 global families? After 9-11, the Patriot Act was implemented. In Britain, the Contingency Act was implemented. Given the rhetoric of both camps in this debate, the only conclusion to be reached would be to allow the attack on Iran to unleash the global intelligence terror squads across the world hitting cities in order they can blame Iran and shut down all nations under their respective emergency powers given they are now fully implemented and drilled. It's like the burning of the Reichstag for Hitler. To attack Iran at this point would unleash hell from the same families that control Iran and the rest of the world. The Committee of 300 would then control the world under absolute dictatorship. Iran will respond ferociously everywhere if we attack Iran.